Good morning, everyone. Welcome to day 200 of DEF CON 26. Uh, so, we have three fabulous speakers for you, and it is their first time talking at DEF CON. So what does that mean? Turn the shot! Shoot the news! So before we get up on stage, just a couple of ground rules. I know you all know this. Uh, at the end of the presentation, we are going to escort them out to the back hallway where they will do Q&A. Please do not bum rush the stage because it will get ugly and there's a guy named Judo out in the hall and well, I'll leave it for you to figure out where he got that handle from. <laughs> Gotta take out my old man glasses. Ugh. I'm Gina Matthews. I'm a computer science professor at Clarkson, and we have Nathan Adams, uh, who's a systems engineer at Forensic Bioinformatics Services, and Jerome Greco, who is a defense attorney at the Legal Aid Society. We're all super thankful that you uh, got up uh, for 10 a.m. to come hear what we think is a really important topic for all citizens of the modern world and, uh, and people interested in technology. We're going to be talking about adversarial testing of software using the criminal justice system. You're just complaining because you're guilty. So software is increasingly used to make huge decisions about all of our lives. I think in this room we know that. From hiring to housing to how we find partners and friends, how we navigate streets, how we get our news, and the weightier the decision, the more crucial that we can understand it and question it. What input is being given to that decision? Is the decision correct for whatever metric you would like to measure it by? Is there other information that really needs to be considered that's not being considered? And what kind of bias is involved in that decision? Are there protected attributes that are being considered like race and gender? Or even if those attributes are not considered directly, what about proxies for those characteristics that are just as effective as the characteristics themselves? The criminal justice system is just one example of this, but it's a pretty important one. And software and algorithmic decision-making is increasingly used throughout the criminal justice system. And usually it's black boxes for which trade secret protection is aggressively claimed. And often the rights, the intellectual property rights of companies are being deemed more important than the, the rights of individual defendants to understand or question the decisions that are made about them or the public's right to a you know, public trial, understand the public trial process. And even besides that, there are many evidences of problems that bubble up. So it's not just that it's a black box. We have evidence that there's trouble. And how are we going to find bugs and fix the problems if the answer is always, you can't question that. You're just complaining because you're guilty. For example, can you imagine being sent to prison rather than given probation because proprietary software says you're likely to commit another crime? But you can't ask how the software makes that decision. That's the Loomis versus Wisconsin case. What about the primary evidence against you in a murder trial being the results of DNA software? But one program says you did it and another says you didn't. That's the Hillary case. What about being accused of murder solely because of DNA transferred by paramedics to the scene? But they don't figure that out for months. That's the Anderson case. Those are real examples. For those of us who build technology, Software, we know that software and complex systems need an iterative process of debugging and improvement. That's just a fact. Anyone who, who uses technology, let alone builds it, knows that there are glitches and bugs and unintended consequences. 
And um, you know how easy it is for there to be substantial bugs that you just haven't found yet, that you're shocked when you find them. There's a huge advantage to independent third-party testing. We just know that. It's well documented. You need teams that are incentivized to find problems rather than teams that have a vested interest in showing that the system is working just fine. Thank you very much. And we're dealing with a system that actively de-incentivizes that. If only those with interest in the success of software see the details, we have a huge problem and a big recipe for injustice. And that's what we're going to be talking about this morning. I'll hand it over to Nathan or to Jerome. So black boxes and proprietary software and trade secrets are increasingly becoming a problem in the criminal justice system. Uh, unfortunately, so much so that we can't discuss all of them today or in as much detail as I'd like, but I'm going to give you an overview of, with some examples so you understand how the problem, what the problem is and how it's actually affecting cases. Uh, just quickly, this is a graph from OSAC which shows all the different forensic disciplines that are being used in the criminal justice system. Uh, some are a lot more accurate and reliable than others. Um, we've broken down the technology being used by law enforcement into four distinct categories, uh, although they're not as distinct as, as they may appear. Some technology fits in multiple categories. Um, in fact, the evidence gathering, evidence assessment categories often bleed into each other, but I will be giving at least one example from each category. Uh, before we get into that, um, I've broken down a lot of the technology based on what I, the three different secrecy levels. So there's secret, which is we don't want you to know this exists, uh, but if you find out it exists, we don't want you to know that we have it at all. And then there's secret as applied, which is we have it, but we don't want to tell you when we're using it, or we don't want to tell you how we're using it. And then there's the trust us category, which is, okay, we have it, we, yeah, we used it in this case, uh, but don't look at the man behind the curtain, stop asking questions, uh, just trust us, it works exactly like we say it does, I mean, why wouldn't it? Starting with predictive policing. So predictive policing is, is basically using data and algorithms to make decisions that were traditionally left up to human law enforcement officers, which in theory, that sounds great, right? You can remove the bias from uh, the system, except in reality, that's not actually how it works. Because if you train the algorithm based upon data that was from years and decades worth of racist uh, policing, you're going to end up with a racist output. And so if you have, uh, you know, and the problem with that is that you have officers who now can say, well, the computer told me, right? Oh, it's not my fault. The computer made the decision. And, and you know, the computer it has no bias. And it's like, well, you kind of trained it to have a bias. Um, it's, so, for example, if you over-police a neighborhood, you're going to make more arrests in that neighborhood, whether or not there's more crime there. Uh, if you feed that into the algorithm, the algorithm is going to think, oh, there's more arrests there, so there's more crime there. So we'll send more officers there, which then will increase more officers making more arrests to meet their quotas and to justify their jobs and their existence, and it becomes a self-feeding circle, um, which is not always actually the best method. In fact, often is not. With this comes a, a lot of uh, a lack of transparency. Most of these companies are requiring non-disclosure agreements, uh, claiming that they have proprietary trade secrets so you can't see how it works under the hood, uh, and also saying that the data that they're using to train these programs or to make the programs work are sensitive so you can't review them. All this is preventing uh, public scrutiny of, of the programs themselves and how they're being used. For evidence gathering, today we're going to focus on cell site simulators and uh, mobile device forensics. So cell site simulator, for those who don't know, is a device that, uh, force, that mimics being a cell phone tower and forces all the cell phones within range of it uh, to connect to it. And then it can lock onto a particular uh, phone and use that to get a very precise location. Uh, for example, a particular apartment in a multi-story building, which is the USB Lambus case. Uh, it also, some of them also have the capability of intercepting content meaning they can intercept text messages and voice phone calls. 
The reason why I don't use the term Stingray device, which is what probably a lot of you have heard it be called, is that Stingray is a very specific model. There are other models like the Hailstorm, uh, and they all have their own capabilities and differences. And so Cell Site Simulator covers all those models instead of just referring to one specific one. Um, most people had no idea, uh, actually pretty much anyone outside of law enforcement and military had no idea that these were being used because they all required non-disclosure agreements. So local, state, and, federal, local, state and, and uh, law enforcement were signing non-disclosure agreements with the company, usually Harris Corporation, and also with the federal government. And so they were being used in criminal cases without, without defense attorneys knowing, without defendants knowing, and of course without the general public knowing. Uh, that has obviously changed, but they are still making their efforts to keep it secret. In fact, the NYPD used one of these devices over a thousand times between 2008 and 2015 without ever once getting a warrant. Uh, we can thank the NYCLU for their great work and being able to prove that. On top of that, to this day, we still don't know which model the NYPD is using because they still refuse to give up that information and they're doing everything they can to keep that quiet, including spending lots of money litigating against it. Uh, but we're gonna talk about a case in which I had uh, worked on, which is People v. Gordon, a case out of Brooklyn. So in People v. Gordon, this was that uh, Matthew Coretta was the attorney uh, of record on the case, and we also had a lot of help from Rebecca Wexler, who was at that time a legal fellow to Legal Aid Society. And essentially, they found our client in a location that really was not connected to him. And traditional cell phone tracking, was not accurate enough to get them to where he was. And so we said, well, the only possible way they could have done this is a cell site simulator. So in our motion, we said, we're moving suppressed, you use the cell site simulator without a warrant. And if you didn't use the cell site simulator, explain to us what you did, because we can't think of another technologically possible way. Prosecutor responds and says, concedes and goes, yeah, okay, we did, we used one. For us, this is a big deal. This is the first time we're aware of in, in New York State on an open case uh, that we have been able to identify when a cell site simulator has been used. So we're ecstatic. We think we, we're going to win. We've got a, a great thing going. Uh, judge issues a decision a few months later, grants our motion to suppress an alleged ID, and we're on top of the world. We think we've broken new ground. The decision gets published. The New York Times article comes out, and then all of a sudden, the NYPD says, no, 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 you're all wrong. We didn't use one. I said, well, a prosecutor in the case just filed in court, you know, with, uh, affirmed in court that you did use one. Obviously not beneficial to their case, so it seemed weird that they would lie about something that was only going to hurt them. Uh, and then on top of it, you had months to correct that record, and it did nothing. It was only when it became very public and there was an article about it that all of a sudden you said, no, no we, we have to deny this. And the only thing we could possibly think of is that there but owned by their non-disclosure agreement, they felt it was necessary to continue their denials, uh, especially when it went public, which is uh, particularly problematic because now it's already been established and they're still in denial. They're still trying to keep it secret even afterwards. Keeping in with this year's DEF CON theme, looking uh, from 1983, looking uh, a year in the future, 1984, uh, this basically is a description of all of, all of us, uh, what we have in our pockets. As most of us know, uh, our cell phones are the, the most successful, largest mass surveillance tool ever created. Um, and so we're going to talk a little bit about mobile digital forensics. Riley v. California was the case of the U.S. Supreme Court that said a warrant is required to look through somebody's phone or pull data from somebody's phone. This is often done uh, with a device called the Celebrate U-Fed Touch. This is a version 2 that you see on the see on the screen, uh, but there are other companies like Magnum, Paraben, and, and others that also provide similar hardware and software. Uh, and the purpose of these is to extract data from your phone so they can be reviewed and, and tagged uh, by law enforcement. Now this isn't really as terrible, right, because it, it's available to outside law enforcement. You, we can test it, we can see if we get the same results, we can see what mistakes it has. Uh, there is a financial barrier, but beyond that, you know, my office has one and I can see if I get the same thing as law enforcement, if I pick up something different or, or the mistakes it may make, right? But that's not true with Celebrate Advanced Services and Grey Key. So we all probably remember the uh, 2015, the San Bernardino shooting case and law enforcement, the FBI and Department of Justice saying to Apple, you need to help us get into this iPhone. Right, you need to put back doors in your encryption and Apple saying, hell no, we're not going to do that. 
thank you, Apple, for once. Um, and <laughs> yeah, one time they do deserve a round of applause. Um, but with that, they um, we get the FBI Department of Justice later withdraws the request and says, well, we got into the phone, we don't need your help anyway. And everybody goes, well, you just told us it was impossible and you couldn't crack it, so what did you do? Uh, shortly after, Celebrate Advanced Services pops up. And what that is, is it uh, allows law enforcement to send the phone to Celebrate. They conduct some secret process and then they send it back to the law enforcement agency unlocked without the encryption and no longer a problem. Recently, Gray Key, which is a product by Gray Shift, has appeared and it also does a similar process or has a similar result, I should say. Uh, but instead of sending it off to a lab, they actually send a, a, an actual product called Gray Key to law enforcement agencies and they can do it in house. Uh, the problem with these, though, is they won't sell it to me. And I can't look at any of this. Uh, as you can see, there's a, even an email telling me uh, no. And I can't know exactly how it works, and I can't verify that it's not deleting information, that it's not changing metadata, but law enforcement's still trying to put this into evidence. Without anybody, and including law enforcement, they're not really sure how it works. They're not in, in uh, Celebrite's lab, and they're not taking apart the gray key device, and they're just trusting it because it benefits them. Um, and to be clear, I don't think Celebrate or Gray Shift uh, are doing anything intentionally malicious, but of course we all know just because you program something to work one way doesn't mean it actually is going to work that way, right? There are bugs, there are flaws, there are plenty of problems. In fact, if that wasn't true, most of this audience wouldn't have jobs or at least would have to find a different hobby. Uh, and we'd probably have a very different conference at DEF CON. So in terms of evidence assessment, I'm talking about facial recognition is that is one of the big things that we're seeing now in the media, especially with recently the ACLU. Uh, challenging Amazon's uh, now foray into this and uh, connecting to actual politicians uh, instead of at the, the actual people that it was meant to connect to. Uh, the problems we're having with this is uh, multiple. One is we're often not being told what company is the actual uh, company being used to determine the facial uh, recognition, the match. Um, and then even if we are, we don't know how the algorithm works or how it's programmed. And we're uh, being told that this blurry surveillance still has a 70% confidence match to either uh, a mugshot or driver's license photo or sometimes social media profile, right? And the whole thing comes down to, okay, let's assume, let's assume that's right. Let's say it is a 70% and you know, I, I can't even verify that because I, I don't know how it works uh, or you won't let me see how it works. But is that enough for that to be used as evidence in a, in a trial? Is that enough for you to arrest somebody? And okay, let's say 70% is not enough. Is 80%? Is that what we really want as evidence in court cases? And if you say 70% is, is more than enough, okay, then what about 60%? Where do we start drawing that line and who gets to make that determination, right? And most of the law enforcement that has very limited rules, if any, on how they're using this and how they're being trained, um, including uh, examples of them actually manipulating photos to make it more likely to get a match, uh, which seems just like evidence tampering to me. Um, in particular, when we have had limited ability to do testing on, on the facial recognition um, which, and, and uh, facial identification through examples of perpetual lineup, which is uh, Georgetown Law, and also the Gender Shades Project, we have seen significant flaws in, based on race, gender, and age. Uh, for example, the Gender Shades Project had showed that uh, Women, uh, dark-skinned women, were more likely to be misgendered by the program uh, than, say, a light-skinned man, right? And leading to more uh, false, <laughs> false identification. And so, part of the reason that that's believed is the way that a lot of these programs are training their algorithms, the, the data they're using, is uh, are light-skinned men. So they tend to be more accurate for that than they would be for a dark-skinned woman. And as a public defender, a large percentage of my clients are people of color, and it makes them already vulnerable uh, in the criminal justice system, even more vulnerable and more likely to be falsely identified. So we'll talk about individualist, uh, individualized assessment. There's, there's a couple different examples there. Um, today, I'm talking about sentencing algorithms, and particularly the State versus Loomis case. This is a case that came out of Wisconsin. Um, it's 
The U.S. Supreme Court chose not to take it up, so it is not law across the country, uh, but is indicative of the fights that are happening everywhere right now across the country. And if and if those local defense attorneys are not challenging it, they should be. And if there are any of them in the room, I'd be happy to talk to you about that later. Um, in this case, they used a risk assessment tool called Compass made by North Point uh, in order to get a report of a recommendation of a sentence for the defendant, Loomis. Um, one of the things that is is acknowledged even by the company is that it takes gender into account when it makes its decision. Uh, one of the ways it does that is that uh, there's the idea that men are more likely to be recidivists, meaning they're more likely to reoffend or be rearrested. Therefore, uh, they are, should be less likely to be given probation. So, if you take a, both a man and a woman uh, who are exactly the same in all other aspects, same crime, same criminal record, everything else. Uh, this program is less likely to suggest probation for the man than it is for the woman. Uh, it's also more likely to su suggest a higher <coughs> sentence uh, for the man rather than the woman. That seems extremely problematic, especially when we're calling this individualized assessments, when you're doing it based upon the history of a group that uh, you were born into. Uh, that that uh, sounds terrible to me. Uh, the other problem is oftentimes we don't know what factors are being included at all. We don't know exactly how, what factors are using. Um, and this is not just for sentencing. This, we're having this problem for uh, bail, for parole. Uh, these decisions are being made. And it's not just Compass. It's, it's plenty of programs out there and more coming up every day uh, to try to take over the market. And even when we know the factors, we don't know how they're weighing. So for example, I don't know how much Compass took into account gender. How significant was that when it makes its decision? That seems like a pretty important thing. But of course, they're hiding behind proprietary trade secrets by saying, well, if we release this information, somebody will steal it from us, a competitor, and all of a sudden we'll, we'll have no jobs. And look, I'm sympathetic to some extent, but that doesn't trump somebody's right. You know, we're talking about people's liberty here. This isn't like a, 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 a minor thing, right? People are going to prison, right? And that's really important that they be able to challenge it, that their defense attorneys be able to give them a full defense. And it's not that we don't want to, it's just that we're actually being hamstrung from doing so. And that's uh, obviously very uh, problematic. Um, and so these black boxes and these plain trade secrets should not be able to be used in the criminal justice system to override somebody's right to face their accuser and to challenge what's happening to them. Whoa. Thank you. <laughs> With that, I'll, I'll leave it to Nathan. Hi, so I'm Nathan Adams. I work for a forensic DNA consulting company in Ohio. And uh, my background is in computing, so I have a little different flavor than a lot of the folks who work in forensic DNA who are typically biologists. So we had the opportunity in a criminal case to examine a previously secret software program that evaluates forensic DNA information um, that was developed by the New York City Office of the Chief Medical Examiner. So when I say OCME, that's the, the lab that developed this program, and FST, Forensic Statistical Tool, is the name they used for it. A little background <clears throat> on it is that FST is approved for use on DNA mixtures containing DNA from two or three individuals. So as a, as a general rule, the more DNA from different individuals you have in, in a mixture, the harder it is to evaluate whether any single person could have contributed. The program does attempt to account for missing data. So if you have an incomplete uh, sample, if it's low level, the signal doesn't, uh, isn't very clear. It also allows for spurious noise, uh, drop-in of, of uh, DNA information, and the output of it is intended to be a very concise likelihood ratio, which is a, a statistical weight in the United States at least, all DNA conclusions uh, that suggest some defendant could be included as a contributor to a sample. That is, their DNA uh, is possibly present on the item of evidence in question. They need to provide a statistical weight because if every other person in the world could have contributed their DNA, if that's as specific as we get for that test, that doesn't give us very much information at all. Half the, the box, the jury box, could uh, similarly be contributors. On the other hand, we get statistics that are uh, suggesting that only one person in the world could have DNA that matches this item, and oh, look, here it's the defendant. 
So FST is supposed to streamline this process for complex mixture interpretation um, problems. Uh, they never sold this to other labs, although they tried. It, what we learned uh, ultimately is that it is a, a fairly straightforward Visual Studio project uh, running C Sharp with a, a SQL backend. And the timeline, uh, we'll, during the middle of the timeline, we'll, we'll take a break and uh, go into the, the problems that we looked into and identified. But FST's initial use was uh, approved by the New York State Commission on Forensic Science in 2010. It uh, evaluates data at 15 locations on the human genome. So we're looking at, at 15 separate genetic uh, locations that it will evaluate. A single reference to that is a locus, plural is loci. Those are the, the locations that we're looking at for those mixtures up to three people. They initially attempted to go up to four people. They published an article that expressly stated their intent to do so. They never did that. In 2011, it took them a little time to, to bring it online, but online, um, it was online as of April of 2011. Started to be used on, on criminal casework. So keep in mind that, that all forensic science is uh, fairly expensive to, to conduct these tests. DNA is no exception to that. So a lot of these investigations are reserved for particularly violent crimes. So in New York City, that would include uh, possession of a firearm. Uh, there's a lot of um, sexual assault, homicide investigations that use DNA or, or they evaluate DNA at least, and uh, sometimes property crimes. But these are um, particularly um, uh, significant investigations that they're making. So. If uh, someone is incriminated by the software, it is in a, a pretty serious situation where they could be facing a lot of time in prison. In 2011, um, I don't know if anybody wants to predict what, what happens next, but um, that same month, they modified their production version of the system and caused it, had, they had to take it offline. Um, so this goes back to what, what Gene and Jerome were saying, you know, everybody makes mistakes. Um, OCME made a big one by modifying their live version of the software. Taking it offline, uh, I think we have documentation now through freedom of information requests that suggests this happened either the first or second week uh, that it was being used on casework again and likely in uh, sexual assault and, and homicide investigations. So these are pretty serious investigations. Uh, we were only told that it was taken offline uh, last fall. That it went seven years without us knowing that uh, they had messed up and had to take it offline. They fixed the problem that they caused taking the, the system offline, but they also made some additional modifications to the program. It was later claimed that these modifications made after the system was validated, after it was approved for use in casework, after it was brought online for casework. They claimed that these changes that they made uh, did not affect the underlying methodology of the program but they didn't tell us they thought that until 2017 because nobody knew that it had happened in the first place. In July of 2011, they finally brought it back online. So it took them three, three months or so to actually get it up and running uh, again after they broke it. In 2016, my company was hired to, to work on a case where the source code to the software had actually been ordered over uh, by a federal court. So uh, Chris Flood and Sylvie Levine, the, the two public defenders in that case, uh, contacted us and asked us to take a look at the software. So we were involved in an in investigation into what FST was actually doing, because this was not only the first time anybody had access to the, the source code, uh, but anybody the first time that anybody had access to an executable version of the system. So nobody had been able to put through uh, different sets of data to test it at any point in its, its uh, lifetime until we got it. This is uh, a short, uh, fairly small set of output that FST produces when it's run in a single case on a, a single evidentiary item. It produces a single PDF as output. This is a portion of that PDF that we generated during our, our investigation. If you look at the columns, they have alphanumeric designations that uh, indicate which genetic location we're looking at uh, on the human genome. So these are, are 1 through 15 that FST is looking at. The first row is a reference profile. So this is somebody's uh, DNA profile. Typically it would be the defendant's DNA profile that they got from a cheek swab or a blood draw. 
and uh, we're making an evaluation to see if that person could be a contributor to the sample. And the three lines below the reference profile or the evidentiary profiles, OCME tests each uh, evidence item three times, two or three times, to develop DNA profiles from those items. So now FST is intending to compare the reference profile to the evidence profile to see whether or not there's support that that person could have contributed their DNA to that item. The statistical weight is reported uh, for four different subpopulations in New York. Uh, Asian, Black, Caucasian, and Hispanic are the des designations because uh, DNA has a, a tendency to be more similar between or within a population than between populations. There is um, going to be a different statistic reported for each one of these. And in an effort to be conservative, the laboratory will report the lowest of those four statistics. The higher that number is, the more support there is for this person included to be included as a contributor. And um, typically that is an incriminating issue. If the defendant's DNA is present on an item, typically that's a, a bad situation for the defense. So this is the laboratory's attempt to be conservative to report the lowest uh, statistic. So this is the significance of the statistic. This is a likelihood ratio. It says that the evidence, that is these three rows of DNA profiles generated from, from evaluating that sample, is 70 times more probable if the sample originated from the reference profile, that is the defendant, and two unknown, unrelated individuals. So this is a three-person mixture. The, this is the prosecution's hypothesis. They posit that the defendant and two unknown, unrelated individuals contributed their DNA to this item, as opposed to the defense's theory that it's just three random people whose, whose identities we don't know. So in the comparison of these two hypotheses, the statistical weight is that it's 70 times uh, more support for the prosecution hypothesis, if the, the prosecution hypothesis is true, rather than if the, the defense hypothesis. The issue with this is that we have uh, documentation of the validation studies conducted by OCME in 2010. And for this same sample, the same evaluation that I just showed you, it wasn't 70.6 that should have been reported, it was 157. So we were scratching our heads when we came across this. This was just a sample that we put through the, the executable of the, uh, the executable version of the, the source code that we were provided in this case. And so we found that something was wrong at first. Of course, I thought that I hadn't configured my version of it correctly. But after double and triple checking everything, we realized that these were, in fact, two different values to be reported. There had been no noise from OCME that this should be the case, that this is the case, that this will be the case. So it was upon us to identify what happened. So these 15 genetic locations, we identified an issue where if we ran the, um, so sorry, these are the different likelihood ratios that were reported between the 2010 validation study and the calculations I'm doing in 2016. We realized that in the, the bottom most image, you'll see that there are three columns and three genetic locations at which I did not give the system uh, any information about the DNA present on the item. And it came up with the same 70.6 value as if I gave it information at all 15 locations. So this, is, uh, this was the, the smell test that led us to uncover some code that was actually tossing data. So there, without acknowledging it to uh, the analyst running the system, to the defendant, or even saying to the world that they do this, OCME in 2011 had started tossing data uh, based on some rule within their system. So this calls into question whether the, the validation study is, is relevant um, because it's studying a system that had been modified and uh, pieces of information were not being considered any longer in the casework version. So as a, a bit of a refresher, a likelihood ratio above one is incriminating. The higher it is above one, the stronger that, that evidence is supposed to be. A likelihood ratio below one is generally exculpatory, is generally uh, supporting um, the, the defense's theory. So when we did a breakdown of this, we identified that one of these locations actually has a likelihood ratio. These likelihood ratios are calculated at each lo genetic location and then multiplied together uh, using the product rule. But we identified that one of them was actually exculpatory. So OCME uh, had told FST to throw out certain types of data. And it turns out that sometimes that data 
is exculpatory. So they are removing information that supports the defense's theory without telling anybody, including the casework analyst running the system. Two of these other locations for this particular sampler are inculpatory, so they would support the inclusion of this person as a contributor. But what we do know from the validation study is this particular individual whose reference profile we're, we're comparing is not a contributor to the system. So it is a false positive that it's above one at all. And we're kind of at a loss as to why it would be so high as, as a, a statistic of 157 in the validation study. And then after they make modifications to the system, which now in 2017, 2018, they're purporting to make it an improvement to the system or, or that it has no substantial impact, we're finding out that they're throwing out data, uh, some of which should be uh, considered exclusionary, should be considering support above the, the defense's theory of the case. The first public acknowledgement of this was in 2017. It was acknowledged by a U.S. attorney, uh, an assistant U.S. attorney. So the first person to publicly disclose that this was in fact happening was uh, a prosecutor that is not uh, a biologist, that is not a laboratory director, that is not a scientist of any sort, but, but a, a prosecutor. The protective order that had been uh, covering our investigation was vacated after uh, substantial effort by uh, ProPublica and the, the Yale Media Freedom and Information Access Clinic, uh, who, who wrote to the judge and, and asked for the protective order to be vacated in the interest of, of the public good, of public interest. The OCME, for some reason, did not oppose this, uh, and then ProPublica posted the code online. <laughs> so if you, uh, if you want to go to this, this GitHub repo has everything that you need um, data-wise to get this running on your system, you will need some, some um, Microsoft products, though, at least to, to make it expeditious. So as a brief recap, and I'm sorry, I need to, to wrap this up quick, but um, 12 samples were tested as regression tests when this modification had been made. And only two of those 12 had samples where data was tossed. So we're modifying, they're modifying FST in a way that is throwing out data. And then to demonstrate that that doesn't affect the operation of the system, they only evaluated 12 samples, but only two of them were affected by the, uh, the modification made. So we have an incredibly small sample size for them to be basing their, their conclusions on. And this is out of a, a total of 439 possible samples that they could have evaluated in this regression test. So that's a, a problem. And then we recently learned that they have had uh, 16 additional quality control tests, they call it, uh, which could indicate that additional modifications to FST have been made that we're not aware of yet. It's only 70 lines, including white space and comments, uh, of the modif modification that was made in 2011. Uh, so that's just demonstrating how much uh, a little bit of code can affect it. And we're just going to run you through a few quotes from, uh, other, from another case that involved similar probabilistic genotyping software, uh, and the reasons why a defendant should not have uh, access to the source code. The responses include from a developer of one of these probabilistic genotyping systems, these complex software systems, is that you don't use source code to validate software. <laughs> and it doesn't get better. <laughs> a professor of medicine says that the only reason you would need to have source code is if you want to modify the program. Uh, DNA technical leader, this is in the forensic DNA laboratory, says we don't need the source code because the source code isn't normally used when we validate software. So we don't need it because we don't need it. Another laboratory director said that, uh, you know what, DNA analysts only get one class in statistics and typically none in computer science. So, you know, what are we going to do with it? Well, I'm here, so, you know. <laughs> so I, I think this is a great one to, to cap it off, and then Gino will take it over. So he poses the question to the court. These are sworn declarations to a court, by the way. They're not just, you know, I was chatting about them, and they told me these things. Um, says, if we're to discuss errors in DNA testing, would you want to, to capture an error rate for the entire workflow? 
for the entire DNA testing process? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, <laughs> is, is that really a question? So Gina's going to uh, explain what else we got going on. So um, we, in addition to this talk, we are, uh, we have uh, Brown Institute Magic Grant uh, to do comparison testing of probabilistic genotyping software systems. We're, we're focusing on FST with and without uh, this uh, uh, check frequency for removal function um, and also comparison to other systems. There are other open source systems available. Um, we're trying to tell this story to a variety of audiences including um, hopefully coverage in the press for a general audience, uh, to the technology audience like you guys, and also to a legal audience. Uh, we recently had articles in The Champion, which is the magazine for the National Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers. And basically we're arguing what I think all of us in this room know perfectly well, that independent third party testing is essential. And unfortunately, independent third-party testing of these systems are really hard. It's hard to get access to the executables, to the hardware, um, and even if you do, it's often under protective order, or it's very expensive. You know, it might be thirty thousand dollars to get the program and five thousand dollars to go to, to training, or you might not even be able. It might even be sold to to independent testers. Um, it's difficult to get old copies of the software or match up results that were reported for particular defendants to the version that was applicable at that time, let alone getting, this is just access to executables, let alone source code or bug databases or testing plans or design documentation or other things that would be incredibly relevant to understanding what the heck is going on. And even if you acquire these things, there's often terms of service that limit the publishing of results. How crazy is that? This problem of trade secret protection aggressively being claimed over the rights of the public and of defendants, we feel is often done really to shield from legitimate questions of quality and fairness. Legitimate questions of quality and fairness, much more so than to protect from competitors. And it is fundamentally thwarting the essential iterative improvement and accountability to stakeholders beyond buyers. If the people purchasing this software are basically just asking the question, are we sending people to jail? Okay, good. Then we have a big problem. Um, and there's also a difficult to connect audiences. If you were to find a bug in FST, how would you be hooked up to a particular defense attorney that might that bug might be relevant? Um, and we would really love you to help. What are some ways you can help? Um, I hope just listening to this talk, you say to yourself, I could have debunked those quotes, right? And I have some serious credentials. Why don't they ask me? So if you say that to yourself, we could hook you up with some defense attorneys that could help you say those things. Um, also, we would really love to see um, advocacy for um, requirements in the procurement phase of software. Once it's in use, and, you know, under certain terms of service or whatever, it's harder. But why not say, if we're going to use public money for criminal justice software, require would be great. Or at least give a lot of credit in the procurement phase for source code, software artifacts like bug reports, internal testing plans, software requirements. Um, no clauses presenting, uh, preventing third-party review. How hard would that be? Come on. Access to executables for third-party testing under reasonable conditions. And here's a big one. Scriptable interfaces to facilitate automated testing. You can get your hands on these things, and if you want to run it through, you know, a, a thousand sample test, you know, what are you going to do that by hand? Um, bug bounties for finding things would be great. Uh, funds for nonprofit third party entities to do independent testing. All these things would be on our wish list. We'd love to see you be third party reviewers. Go get your hands on FST or Lab Retriever or LRMix or Lake LTD or UrForMix, other open source PG systems predictive policing software like CivicScape, take a look. Find some bugs or bad code. Please do something about it yourself, but also let us know. Um, construct software yourself based on published alternatives and then compare the results you're getting to the black boxes. So many things our community could do to change this conversation. Please help us do that. Um, and the big picture is that black box decision making is happening all around us. And our community could do a lot to bust open those black boxes or to compare them to one another or to fight for accountability and transparency. 
Um, the Association for Computing Machinery's tech policy groups came out with a set of principles for algorithmic accountability and transparency. That could be a place to start. If you're involved in building software systems, you could point your team and your boss and your company to this is some professional ethics guidelines that say we should be building in awareness, access and redress, accountability, explanation, data provenance, auditability, validation, and testing. We can all do a lot to provide the evidence that's needed to improve systems for all stakeholders so that we're not running our society on buggy or possibly even malicious algorithms that are hidden from view. We would like to thank the many people uh, without whom our work would not be possible. Um, a special shout out to, we have four of our students who are, are working with us here in the crowd. Uh, Mariama, Marzia, Stephen, and Abby, you guys could wave. Um, and I will simply end with, um, please get in touch with us if, if, you, if you think you can help with this effort. In full disclosure, the best way to get a hold of us is probably the three direct emails, but uh, we tried to set up some more joint ways. Uh, we, we set up a Twitter software justice. It's just recently set up, so um, be gentle with it. We also set up a Discord channel. Um, if you find us software justice on Twitter, there's a recent link uh, with an invitation to our Discord channel. We're working on setting up a, su uh, a subreddit for software justice, um, but it's not uh, up yet. But please uh, get a hold of us and uh, let's all work on this because I think our community could make a big difference and a big difference is really needed. Hey, it's me, Cameron Salmon. Please like and subscribe if you enjoyed this video or learned something. Comment below if you want me to continue making these types of videos.